Patients on ventilators. Overwhelmed doctors. Face masks. Lockdowns. Army trucks taking away the bodies of COVID-19 victims and new infections and deaths reported every day. Until March 2020, these were images only seen in China, where the virus felt far away. But in the blink of an eye, it had hit northern Italy and spread to the whole of Europe. In a matter of weeks, a worldwide pandemic would be declared and our lives would never be the same. Welcome to our COVID-19 special on DW. I'm Monica Jones in Berlin, and I vividly remember sitting here in the studio last year reporting on the horrors in the Italian region of Lombardy. Little did we know that COVID-19 would soon dominate all our lives, and still does. Bergamo may once again look like a quiet northern Italian city. But it was here that the pandemic gained its foothold in Europe. It was the first place where the horrors of COVID-19 were felt outside of China. Emergency stations were transformed into intensive care units, and not all patients could be treated. Cemeteries were overflowing, and military trucks had to transport coffins out of the city. The Pope John XXIII Hospital was at the center of the outbreak. Today, the number of coronavirus patients is a small fraction of a year ago. The director of the emergency station suspects that Bergamo's residents have developed a form of herd immunity to the virus. Many of the people who had antibodies in their blood last March were tested again in December, and they still had antibodies in their blood eight months later. Of those people, hardly anyone was infected again. After the first wave, the city's health officials ordered extensive blood tests. These showed who had already been infected. More than 40% of those tested had antibodies against COVID-19, perhaps explaining why significantly fewer people were infected during the second wave in late 2020. But now, another problem has officials concerned. I think we may have survived the worst of it, but it's far from over. We have to look carefully at the mutations that are spreading, because they could completely change the virus and the situation here. The outbreak left even survivors traumatized, and it wiped out nearly an entire generation of seniors, among them Stefano Fusco's grandfather. There's a saying that fits this tragedy very well. Every time an old man dies, it's like a library was burned down. We saw a lot of libraries burn here. It's a huge wound that will never heal. He said the lockdown in Bergamo came much too late to save those like his grandfather. He founded an organization to seek justice and take legal action against the public officials he said let it happen. 5,000 people joined up. But for now, Fusco says he wants to transform anger into something constructive. And one year after the coronavirus catastrophe, to make sure that something like that never happens again. And I'm joined now on the line by Enrico Storti, head of the critical care department and ICU at Cremona Hospital in Italy. Cremona, of course, also being a beautiful old town in the Lombardy region that was hit by the pandemic last spring. And uh, Dr. Storti, you were right in the thick of it. Um, how did you experience that terrible first wave last spring? Uh, yeah, I can perfectly can recall exactly the time when uh, we knew that uh, we were facing uh, COVID-19 uh, because we have been the very first one to diagnose this uh, infection in Europe. And uh, at that time, it was clear that uh, we were forced to, to face something which was uh, uh, totally unexpected and uh, and nobody did it in the last uh, uh, 100 years here in Europe. So uh, it was uh, the idea that uh, we have to find uh, the way 
to uh, to fight uh, against uh, a uh, pandemic problem which was uh, really astonishing at the time and you had to make hard choices also something that you probably don't have to do every day uh, yeah i think that uh, what should be clear is that uh, um, the, the scenario we were forced to to face was uh, a sort of worst scenario, a sort of mass casualty problem, uh, where the definition of mass casualty is when there's a huge disproportion between the number of patients you have to, to take care, to take care, and uh, the uh, resources that you have available. So at that the time was very uh, difficult and important to uh, balance uh, the uh, resources, which means uh, physicians, which means uh, ventilators, which means beds, and uh, how to re uh, rearrange and reshape uh, the hospital organization to meet uh, something which was uh, totally different from the routine uh, um, apparatus. That, that must be, have been very tough. I mean, are all your colleagues still on board, or did some say, this, this is too much, I quit? Yeah, uh, I promise you that, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, to cope uh, with a situation, with a sort of a worse scenario, worse situation, uh, what was the shift, uh, what was the, uh, let me say, the peacetime organization was uh, totally reverted. So uh, it's clear that at that time uh, uh, there were uh, many, many hours to be, to be covered in terms of shift and also uh, let me say that uh, uh, COVID-19 for a, an intensivist means uh, uh, severe respiratory distress, which means uh, a huge uh, need of uh, ICU care. So uh, the physicians were uh, tired, were uh, pressed by a number of patients with a, a very critical condition. And so nobody quit, nobody say no, nobody surrender to the situation, but uh, if you are asking me uh, what has been the cost of uh, this choice, uh, for sure has been extremely high. So uh, what is the situation now compared to a year ago? Uh, let me say that from the organizational perspective, of course, now we are uh, well prepared and we, um, we know better this kind of, of pathology, this kind of infection in the very beginning this was totally unknown, uh, and so that was uh, an issue at that time. Now we are, we are more ready and we have a more uh, deeper knowledge about uh, what we have to do and about uh, what the COVID-19 infection is. But unfortunately, meantime, we are speaking uh, the curve, the infection curve and the epidemiologic uh, uh, perspective is uh, very close to the first wave. So... Um, Unfortunately, I think that we have to fight a little bit uh, longer, uh, waiting for the vaccine strategy um, to I just, be fine. And, and just very briefly, if you could utter a wish to politicians, what do they need to do now? Uh, I think that we have to talk uh, each other and we have to balance again uh, the, uh, the actual uh, resources, what is now available, and forecasting very wisely what to do in the, in the next uh, two, three months in order to address our effort. All right, Dr. Enrico Storti from Cremona Hospital in Italy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, one positive side effect of the pandemic, more people have been getting a flu jab, but there are still reservations towards COVID-19 vaccines. Are they justified? Time to ask Derek. My elderly in-laws have already survived the infection. Is vaccination recommended for them? I'm not a doctor and your in-laws need to talk to one about what's recommended for their specific, unique medical situation. Um, but they can go into that discussion informed. So. Let's go back over a few fundamentals of this pandemic that are important to keep in mind. Um, first and foremost, the elderly are the group most at risk when they get this disease. In some places, 
four and five of the people who've died from COVID-19 have been over 65. That's why in vaccine rollouts, nearly everywhere, uh, the elderly are at the top of the distribution list because evidence is now really piling up that vaccines really do reduce severe disease, hospitalization, and death in that group. Um, second, in trials, older people generally responded very well to approved vaccines. And going on 300 million shots worldwide, they're still doing so. So the chances that a vaccine will present some kind of danger to their health are vanishingly small. And there's a reason why, which is vaccines don't make you sick. Many people still have to be reminded of that. Um, approved vaccines don't contain SARS-CoV-2. They contain things that fake an infection with it. And that can cause side effects as your immune system reacts, sometimes even fairly powerful side effects. But, but those are signs the vaccine is working and are almost always quite short term. Um, the third point I want to make is that health authorities pretty much all recommend everyone get vaccinated when they have the chance, even if they have the disease and have recovered, because then the vaccine acts as a booster and can help shore up the immune response even more. Um, there might be some instances, for example, where someone is extremely frail or where there are serious underlying conditions where, where doctors might recommend postponing vaccination. But if they were recommending that for my in-laws, I'd certainly make them explain why, um, because vaccines save lives. And Derek Williams will be back next week as will COVID-19 special. Thanks for watching.